Let's start with a question. How do you read a work of fiction? If you're anything like me and my friends, you probably have a pretty playful relationship with fiction. For example, in addition to enjoying the object of fiction as it's packaged and presented, you probably feel free to speculate about ideas the narrative leaves unaddressed, or about the backstories of the characters. You probably feel free to make fun of the object of fiction, or point out its inevitable plot holes. And you probably even enjoy occasionally contemplating new meanings or identities, or creatively combining elements to find something new. Okay, so here's another question. How do you read the news? If you're like most people, you probably say you read it a little differently than a Star Wars movie. After all, the news is based on fact, and fiction is based on... well... But, as media that are produced based on a series of conventions in order to interpret and make meaning out of social relations, conflicts, and differences, the difference between a week of the news and a season of Game of Thrones is merely one of modality. The biggest difference between the news and Game of Thrones or Star Wars is less its form or its content than it is the understood relation between the reader and the text. More commonly, the reading relation with a piece of fiction is understood to be plural, multifarious, changing reading to reading or viewing to viewing, or even over the course of a single reading. We can read a text for its face value intended meaning, we can negotiate with meaning of a text, or we can derive meaning that's in opposition to what it's supposed to mean. For a really great discussion of this, you really should check out PBS Idea Channel's episode on media consumption. But the news more commonly is understood to have an authoritative relationship to its reader. The news, which is supposed to be unbiased and objective, is about real things in the real world. But regardless of the fact that the news is often biased along partisan lines these days, I have a newsflash for you. The news is not real. I'm not saying that reality doesn't happen. I'm saying that the news is a medium through which we are supposed to have access to the real events. A medium, though, that by its nature cannot transparently represent that reality. To talk about what that means, I'm going to be looking at two works of media theory and criticism. The first is media scholar John Fiske's 1987 book, Television Culture, one of the first works broadly applying post-structuralist semiotics to television texts. And if you need a refresher on what semiotics is all about, check out this video. The other is the 1989 book, Policing the Crisis, by cultural theorist Stuart Hall, along with Chaz Critcher, Tony Jefferson, John Clark, and Brian Roberts. Hall et al. for short. Both of these works are concerned with how signs like TV and news texts work on readers by constructing authoritative representations of reality. Understanding how this works will allow us space to talk about ways we can change our reading relations with the news, and ultimately how to think and interact more critically and effectively with cultural texts that we encounter all the time. If the job of the news is, as Fisk puts it, to tell the story of the key events of the last 24 hours, then we already have a problem. A lot of stuff happens in 24 hours. So, Fisk says, the first struggle of news is to impose the order of culture upon the polymorphous, or variably shaped, nature of the real. The news text is engaged in a constant struggle to contain the multifarious or different kinds of events and their polysemic potential, that is, their potential to mean different things, within its own conventions. For news is as conventional as any other form of television. Its conventions are so powerful and so uninspected because the tyranny of the deadline requires the speed and efficiency that only conventions make possible. The type of stories, the forms that they'll take, and the program structure into which they will be inserted are all determined long before any of the events of the day occur. Because of these constraints, the news has strategies of selecting which events of the day are worth covering. Selection is the beginning of the process of containing events and their meaning. As Hall et al. write, if the world is not to be represented as a jumble of random and chaotic events, then they must be identified that is, named, defined, related to other events known to the audience, and assigned to a social context that is, placed within a frame of meanings familiar to the audience. This bringing of events within the realm of meanings means, in essence, referring unusual and unexpected events to the maps of meaning which already form the basis of our cultural knowledge. So the news is interested in containing the real, 
Fisk says that it does this in several conventional ways. I'll touch on a few of them here. Fisk cites work by other media scholars showing that for events to be newsworthy, it should fall into one or more of the following categories. News events should have happened in the last 24 hours, meaning that news looks for events that can be framed as having a point of origin and a point of closure. This strategy ends up obscuring the often complex and long-term factors at play in any given event. Secondly, events should concern people in positions of power. Politicians, officials, police officers, sports and entertainment celebrities, etc. whose familiarity helps to quickly convey the narrative. For the same reasons, people who aren't familiar are fitted into familiar roles. The disaster survivor, the minority spokesperson, the victim, the expert, etc. Fisk says that this underscores the idea that social and political issues are only reported if they can be embodied in an individual, transforming social conflict into conflicts between individuals and obscuring the broader social origins of events. A limited range of people is given access to the news, Fisk writes, and very few social positions are allowed to speak. Newsworthy events are negative. They disrupt the normal. Fisk points out that the common complaint is that the news is always bad or terrifying, but what that assumes is that life is ordinarily smooth running, rule abiding, and harmonious. But that's less a description of how reality is and more a prescription of how we ought to understand it to be. This works in the opposite direction too, with negative events from, say, developing countries or the Middle East becoming assumed to be normal for their society reinforcing the idea that ours is normally stable, fair, and good, and that theirs is normally the opposite. Fisk calls another set of strategies clawback, or the reporting structure that works to claw back potentially deviant or disruptive events into the dominant value system. For example, Fisk describes how the news establishes a spatial hierarchy that signifies different levels of objectivity or truth that obscures its role in constructing reality out of convention. In the central space is the newsreader or anchor, who doesn't appear to be the author of their own discourse, but rather speaks the objective discourse of the truth. No radical, disruptive voices speak from this space. Further away is the reporter or correspondent, who mediates between raw reality and the truth of the news anchor. The reporter is a step removed, individual, whose truths are made to appear more subjective than the studio anchor. Farthest from the studio is the eyewitness, the spokesperson, the rolling film, whose truth is deemed the most subjective and raw. Always a threat to break the conventions imposed upon it by the programming, even though it's ultimately the studio anchor who authenticates it and produces its meaning in the first place. Finally, Fisk borrows an idea from semiotician Roland Barthes called ex nomination to describe the process of removing voices from the semiotic realm of differences and alternatives, speaking the disembodied voice of the White House, or management, or two separate sources with intimate knowledge of the event in question, is to render those voices as authoritative, universal, or those which cannot be challenged. They are ex-nominated. On the other hand, disruptive, oppositional, or minority voices are often nominated. They're given their particular names and described status as individuals, positioned lower on the truth hierarchy as merely one point of view, subjective, susceptible to alternatives. So it should be pretty clear that the containment and production of meaning is pretty tied up with power, but it's also tied up with pleasure. Drawing on the role of Laura Mulvey and Roland Barthes, among others, Fisk asserts the role of pleasure and play in the way we read texts. There's pleasure in confirming your identity, which can take the form of submitting to the authoritative reading relation of the news. We take pleasure from sticking to news sources that align with our political identities, for example. But there's also pleasure in breaking the rules, which is where play comes in. Reading is not a simple sender-receiver operation. No, as readers, we have the ability to play a text like a musician plays a score. We interpret the text, we activate it, we give it life. We also play the text like a game, choosing to accept the rules of the text in order to participate in the pleasurable process of producing our own meanings and identities. This is just like what we talked about in the beginning with fiction. Play is a power transformation, a remaking of the world to follow different sets of rules. Think about playing make-believe when you were a kid. Fisk writes, 
The arguments between the child who plays according to the rules, you're dead, and the one who brings reality into it, no I'm not, see I'm still breathing, are arguments about who has the power to construct a representation of reality that is binding upon others. Now that we know how the news contains and produces meaning, we can work to change our reading relations with them in order to negotiate with them, or decenter them, or even oppose them. There's pleasure in playing a text. There's also power in it. But why is it important to change our reading relations with the news? Why should we care how we read? Short answer is because most if not all of our interaction with the world and other people is mediated by signs and texts of some kind or other. And because of that, our interaction with the world and other people is first and foremost an exercise in the interpretation of meaning, and meaning is political. Here's how Stuart Hall and his companions answered this question. What then is the underlying significance of the framing and interpretive function of news presentation? We suggest that it lies in the fact that the media are often presenting information about events which occur outside the direct experience of the majority of the society. The media thus represent the primary and often the only source of information about many important events and topics. The media define for the majority of the population what significant events are taking place, but also they offer powerful interpretations of how to understand these events. Implicit in those interpretations are orientations towards the events and the people or groups involved in them. To me, this is important. The way we interpret texts has huge consequences on the way we view other people, as well as the complex, nuanced, polysemic events that work together to weave our entire social world. The news in many ways dominates our textual engagement with that world. Now, more than ever, it's time to play. News. 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 Has a, has a, has a, has a kind of mystery. Has a, has a, has a kind of mystery. When I shook hands, when I 